Hello um, and welcome to this joint event between LSE Ideas and the Carnegie Endowment uh, for Europe. Um, we are discussing a foreign policy for the middle class, US and UK perspectives. I'm Gideon Rathman from the Financial Times. I'm in London uh, bringing you uh, together with a an all-star cast who are variously scattered around London, Washington DC, Annapolis. Let, let me um, introduce them to you. Um, we have uh, from Washington, Dame Karen Pierce, uh, the British ambassador to the United States. Joining her is uh, Robert Zellick, the former president of the World Bank, deputy US Secretary of State, author of a uh, new book, America, and also of a very pertinent um, FT op-ed today on uh, British uh, US relations. We're also the author of two reports, which really are the foundation of our discussions today. Um, Linda Yu, who's visiting professor at the LSE, and chair of the LSE Committee on Economic Diplomacy, which I also played a modest role in, and Rosalind Engel of the Carnegie Endowment, um, who has held many senior positions in the US government and is one of the co-authors of the Carnegie Report, making US foreign policy work better for the middle class. Uh, and we'll come to the discussion in a moment. But first of all, let me just briefly hand you over to Professor Michael Cox, Founding Director of LSE Ideas is going to say a few words. Mick. Uh, well, thank you very much, Gideon, and welcome to everybody. And thank you to Carnegie for hosting this uh, transatlantic event. And let me just say who I am. My name is Professor Mick Cox. I'm Emeritus Professor here uh, at, the, at the LSE and indeed one of the founding directors of LSE Ideas, which is the LSE's uh, think tank within the university-affiliated think tank system. We were created back in 2008, a little bit after the Carnegie uh, Endowment and the Carnegie uh, Institute, which was created in 1910 by that fine Scotsman who became an American, uh, Andrew Carnegie. The life of Andrew Carnegie, most of you should know well, 2,000 libraries, and an extraordinary philanthropist who gave away nearly all of his money and indeed set up what is now today, I think, one of the world ranking number one think tanks in the world. I have to say that as a, I'm not a, I'm not a competitor with, with, with the Carnegie. One of the, great, one of the great presidents of the Carnegie was a man called Nicholas Murray Butler, who was a philosopher and educator. And he said, experts know more and more about less and less, and that's what defines an expert. He also said, if you want to get anything done, you've got to be an optimist. And in some ways, this, this commission, which we've been working on myself with Linda Yu and so many other people has brought together so many great experts from around the world. And we've done it, I think, uh, with an optimistic frame of mind, believing, and I think we have to believe in the age in which we're leaving, lead, uh, living, that if we're not optimistic about the future, we don't believe things can be changed by rational discussion and rational debate then we might as well give up. And what we've done in this report, and we'll be talking about that in more detail when Linda introduces it, is to put forward a series of proposals, realistic, forward-looking proposals, which we think can take both uh, UK and indeed uh, the rest of the world forward. So I don't want to say any more. Uh, I just, again, want to thank all those who have participated in it. I want to give a very special welcome to Bob Zellick, who helped launch this or oh, nearly two to three years ago, Bob. And I want to say a very special word of welcome, of course, to Karen Pierce. Who I have to say, and I always see this, and Karen knows what I'm, going to, what I'm about to say, did her master's degree in LSE ideas over 10 to 11 years ago. So with no further ado, I'll pass it back to you, Gideon, to, to chair the rest of the meeting and hand on to Linda. Thanks again, everybody, and thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, thanks very much indeed, Mick. Uh, and thanks for giving us an early taste of the LSE Ideas report. Uh, we're also obviously discussing two reports, and I think it's fascinating that on different sides of the Atlantic, people were working on similar themes about how to reconnect the public with the bigger goals of foreign policy. Uh, the Carnegie report uh, has got a lot of attention in America, partly because of the involvement of people who are now very senior in the American government. But to uh, get more of a taste of that and, and what was involved, let me now turn you over to Ros Engel. Ros, can you tell us, give us a, a brief idea of what the, the central ideas of the report were? Sure. Um, I think I might tell you a little of the story of the report too, and then I'll get to um, the, the kind of main findings. But 
The group got together in 2017 after the presidential election, um, which was, you know, a pretty sharp repudiation of kind of the bipartisan foreign policy consensus to kind of think about what might have gone wrong, what needed to change, what didn't need to change. Um, and they took a kind of different sort of approach. So the idea was, and Bill Burns put this really well in a, I think it was an Atlantic article called Bought the Blob Meets the Heartland. So the blob in the United States is the foreign policy elite establishment, right? And it's going to meet the heartland. So the report basically took the approach of going and speaking to um, the American public uh, in Ohio, Colorado, and Nebraska. Um, so we had a research team that went out, spent basically three years talking to people around the country, economic development experts, community groups, um, university partners, businesses, chambers of commerce, trying to understand kind of what did foreign policy mean to them? Um, what were their basic interests in terms of foreign policy? Um, how did they want the US government to involve, um, engage in foreign policy? So that was um, a sort of a different methodology than you sometimes see in foreign policy reports, um, kind of looking inside out, uh, trying to understand really fundamentally some of these kind of driving, enduring national economic interests. And from that, so I should say, so that that's the kind of, you know, approach. And what was interesting also were some of the people who were involved. So this is 2017, Bill Burns had come to, from the State Department to Carnegie. Um, Jake Sullivan um, had moved over to Carnegie. He was in the Geoeconomics and Strategy Program. Salman Ahmed was also in the Geoeconomics and Strategy Program. Salman was really the leader of the project um, for three years, really ushering it along. He's now moved over to state as the director of the policy planning group. Jake, as you know, is the national security advisor and Bill Burns has moved over to CIA. So a really interesting group of people who were spending a lot of time thinking about how to make foreign policy work better, be more responsive, um, be more accountable. Um, and, and maybe deliver more tangible benefits in some sense to the American public. So that was kind of the background. Um, in terms of what the group found, um, there were sort of five takeaways. One was that we needed to broaden the policy debate beyond just trade. So we'd gotten very um, sort of wrapped up in trade debates and trade problems. Um, and really trade, what we learned was really a proxy for kind of a general anxiety about the ability to compete um, globally. <laughs> So that was one big takeaway. A second was that we really needed to grapple better with equity concerns. So trade is an inherently redistributive process. Globalization is an inherently redistributive process. Um, yes, there might be some big efficiency gains, but there also are some big redistributive processes underneath and we needed to kind of deal with those, be a little more explicit, a little more careful and deliberate in how we dealt with those. Um, we needed to strengthen policy integration we needed to not have foreign policy on one track, domestic policy on another track, and not have the two talking to each other. Um, so Bill's written a lot about the domestic economic renewal, and, and you've heard that a bit in the Biden speech at uh, President Biden's speech at the State Department, I think it was last week or two weeks ago. So the same idea of we need to do domestic economic renewal, we need to um, be engaging with the world from a position of strength. Um, a more measured foreign policy. We needed to be more careful in how we deploy U.S. power. Um, we need to be globally engaged, um, that whole set of issues. And then we needed to try to build a new foreign policy consensus. And there was a sense that we might be able to do that by focusing on the, these basic middle class interests. It's something that is bipartisan. Um, it could create a more stable foundation for a foreign policy agenda than maybe ideological or more narrow geopolitical frameworks. So I think I should probably leave it there because there's lots of people who have lots of things to say. Thanks. That was that was a fascinating introduction. And Linda, it struck me listening to that that there were some parallels what, with what you were doing with the LSE, where I know, at least before COVID struck, there was a very deliberate effort to get out around and talk to audiences outside London. So give us a sense of what the LSE ended up concluding. Thanks very much, Gideon. And let me just um, also just add my welcome and to uh, <laughs> uh, to the lovely panelists. Um, 
on this um, discussion. I think um, couldn't have asked for a better group of people to uh, to think about UK US. Um, and I think you know, listening there to um, to Roz's um, encapsulation of their report, there are a number of similarities. You're right, Gideon, in both in terms of our approach, and I think in some of our aims. And obviously, our conclusions are specific to our own countries. But what I hope we can bring out in this discussion is the ways in which those similarities um, might begin to build um, UK-US relations um, for the 21st century. And indeed, that was uh, the aim of this commission. Um, so the LSE Economic Diplomacy Commission um, included 18 commissioners, um, leading uh, LSE academics, as well as a wide range of experienced practitioners. Um, so the coverage of subjects was extremely broad. It wasn't just economics, it was also international relations, environment, business, foreign policy, and national security. And by bringing together um, this very, um, and a number of them had uh, served in um, very senior roles in the UK government and are active um, in, in this policy space. Um, so by bringing together academic research plus um, experience, and Gideon, you're absolutely right, what we um, tried to do before, and we did do some of it before COVID made it um, uh, not possible, is to go around uh, the UK um, and to hear evidence from you know, a very diverse and broad range of people. And in the end, we ended up hearing from dozens of uh, participants um, on this overall question, which is, um, and of course, um, you know, lots of countries seem to look at this issue of how you position your economic diplomacy uh, broadly defined as your foreign economic policy. Um, but of course, with Brexit, the UK was tasked with setting its own um, independent trade policy for the first time since the 1970s. So the the need was um, was certainly there to think about how to refine this framework, and that was the thought of this commission. And you know, we approached it using several different, um, I would say. Um, underlying themes, one of which is, of course, to support an open multilateral system, uh, support free and fair trade. Um, and I think we also um, have to think about breaking down silos in, in terms of um, what this means to have an economic diplomacy framework. It can't just be around trade. It has to be how trade and investment policies in a global role aligns with foreign policy aims writ large. So by which I mean, again, very broadly, the non-economic um, foreign policies around international relations, around uh, the environment, all of that needs to be aligned with how the UK sets its investment and trade policies. And that theme of breaking down silos, we also um, stressed, especially in terms of the recommendations, which is to essentially try to remove a distinction between domestic and foreign, because all economic policy is ultimately domestic um, and it's foreign. It's basically needs to be treated as one. And thinking about economic and non-economic issues together in the foreign uh, policy sense um, is that, um, so essentially breaking down uh, these various divisions um, so that we can make recommendations and essentially connect um, uh, what's happening on the trade front with what's happening in domestic policy. Now, I'm myself an economist, and I'll just give you one example of, of the benefits of this kind of approach, um, which is, if you think about the um, distributional impact of trade, it does leave um, some behind because the sector in which the country no longer specializes in as much, um, that sector does get left behind. So the trying to uh, make sure that's addressed, um, this distributional impact involves not just setting um, trade um, policies um, in terms of level playing field and other um, air and other things within the FTA itself, the free trade agreement itself, it also means using domestic redistributive and pre-distributive mechanisms by which I mean, you know, using domestic fiscal policy to support regions that are feeling the impact of trade. And so that combination uh, means that you have a much, uh, I think, a holistic view uh, to how to uh, make 
um, foreign economic policies work better for everyone in society. And I think that's where we have some resonance and similarities uh, with the um, Carnegie um, report, which I thought was a really interesting read. So I'm just going to finish with um, what our recommendations were, and I'm happy to discuss these in, um, obviously as we go through the webinar, which is the three main areas that we recommend um, the UK use to think about refining its economic diplomacy framework. And the framework has those underpins I've described, but the three kind of areas in which our recommendations fall are the UK should set its trade and investment policy optimally for the 21st century world economy, but recognize that there are geoeconomic tensions. So for instance, um, looking at including a non-economic track and trade negotiations is one of the recommendations, positioning the UK um, in terms of uh, make taking advantage of the big trends in 21st century trade growth around services and digital trade. Um, you know, those all fall within the first part of our recommendations and those recommend a multi-layered approach. Part of it is bilateral, some of it is actually unilateral, um, but there's also a need to push at the multilateral level or pluralistically where you can bring a group of countries together to make progress on areas where you don't have global rules, for instance, or rules that need updating. So the second part of the recommendations is just that in the UK's global role that's very much focused on bringing together countries um, to advance shared interests, for instance, in global public goods like the environment. And then the last set of recommendations is around institutional changes. I've already described one around having impact assessment and using domestic policy to help those um, that have been disadvantaged by trade and investment. And we also have recommendations there around decentralizing foreign direct investment um, to some extent, um, as well as expanding institutional capacity to conduct foreign economic policy, which includes developing a cadre of economic diplomats that go through different UK departments, but then also get seconded to international organizations that both increases knowledge and we could up the UK's influence in those global institutions. So we've got, a um, obviously there's a lot more in the report, but I'm gonna pause there, Gideon, and, um, and look forward to uh, the rest of this discussion. Great. Uh, thanks very much indeed, Linda. Um, so if I can turn to Ambassador Pierce, I mean, I, obviously the government, uh, the current British government took place against uh, the background of Brexit. We've heard a lot of talk uh, in both uh, these reports about the need to um, take account of domestic economics more in foreign policy. The government talks a lot about leveling up. I wondered on a practical level, as you conduct foreign policy on a day-to-day -day basis, how, how possible has it been to incorporate the ideas such as leveling up the domestic uh, e economy into foreign policy? Uh, well, thanks very much, Gideon, and thank you to Carnegie and LSE for inviting me. Uh, th this is a fascinating uh, topic, and I was really uh, impressed, Roz, by the way uh, you went about the, the report in, in such an unusual uh, way, as you say, but I think it probably fills the gap in our understanding of bringing foreign and domestic policy together that, that we've we've missed without really knowing uh, we missed it until you, you came out with the report. Um, and I do think there's something very important about this compete uh, agenda. I do think uh, it, it, it sounded familiar and, and um, reasonable that that would be what was driving people's concerns uh, rather than trade uh, per se. And I think, Gideon, that also answers uh, your question. We don't come to work every day in the embassy thinking we must uh, join with the US and join with Europe and compete uh, with China. Uh, but it is certainly true that since COVID and the focus on Build Back Better, uh, we realise that that is actually uh, what we need to do. Uh, it underpins the economic resilience we're looking at as part of our G7 presidency. Uh, we have a panel on that. Uh, and it really underpins technology. Uh, no one wants to wake up and find that all the standards on technology, uh, having been Western, open, multi-stakeholder, uh, getting the right balance of public access to these technologies for the benefit of citizens, uh, that's the system we have had since 1945. Uh, we don't suddenly want to wake up 
uh, one morning and find out that they are all very government and regulation dominated. Uh, in other words, authoritarian. And the Secretary General of the UN has been calling attention to this uh, for quite a while. Uh, but I think it's now a concept uh, that we're talking about more and more. Uh, and it underpins uh, what Boris Johnson is trying to do at the G7 by bringing together a group of democratic but also technologically advanced countries. And as Linda was saying, uh, this is pluralistic. Uh, it is going to be the way of making things work in future, I think. Uh, some things are complicated, very difficult to do at the multilateral level, uh, so they're done plurilaterally. Doesn't mean they can't be open to all who want to join, but it is probably sensible uh, to start with that group. Uh, so we do take account of it, to, to go back to Gideon's question. Uh, we do try and think about open societies uh, in a way that keeps societies moving forward. And just as um, Gideon and Linda were talking, uh, I was thinking of a, a metaphor for Britain. And, and, you know, Britain used to be this great uh, free trading nation back in the 19th uh, century. And I think now we um, can be more agile in some of our policy making. Uh, I think we could again start to think about charting uh, a way forward, as Linda was saying, as, as the recommendations say, charting a way forward uh, on certain aspects of trade, uh, looking at it from the climate perspective, integrating that into how companies do their investments, uh, for example, looking at how we build in labour and environment and digital uh, into trade agreements. So I'm, I'm quite excited uh, by that thought. And on levelling up, yes, that does guide uh, what we do very much in the COVID uh, build back better sense. Uh, there's very much a feeling on both sides of the Atlantic that we should not squander uh, this moment as we come out of COVID uh, and what that means to have sustainable economies and where we need to put our joint effort not just on science and innovation, uh, but in dealing with all these different equities. Thanks very much, Karen. Uh, Bob, if I can turn to you now. Um, I mean, that there's uh, clearly sort of similar people thinking along similar lines in Washington and London. And yet um, there's quite a lot of anxiety, I think, in the UK that the Biden administration would be very focused on the EU, wouldn't be that interested in the UK, at least initially. Um, but you've written in that fine paper, the FT today, uh, that you actually think that US-UK relations, uh, that there's a lot that can be done together. So would you like to elaborate? Well, first, uh, Gideon, I'm, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to be with all of you. Uh, it's encouraging to see uh, an English delegation at an institution founded by a Scottish immigrant to America uh, right after Mardi Gras. So this augurs very well for global Britain. Um, and I want to have a particular welcome to Ambassador Pierce. Say, while she was in the U.S. at the U.N., I think she came to Washington just about the time of COVID. And uh, British ambassadors normally are sort of wonderful participants in the larger Washington community, and she's probably been somewhat restricted, so I'm glad she could be with us today. Uh, and I also want to compliment uh, Linda and LSE and, and the whole commission uh, for a very quality contribution at a very important moment. So, uh, Gideon, in addressing your question, um, I'd like to make sort of three points. And so far, we've had great Anglo-American amicability, and I'm, I'm going to press a bit. Um, so first, I, I think this is a turning point for the UK. And I can imagine three paths. One is to withdraw into Little England. Two, which I think is more likely but equally uh, troublesome, would be what I'll call a frustrated Britain. And you can, you can see this daily in the reporting from the FT, where Britain is stuck in some uncomfortable orbit around the EU, and there's perpetual solar flares over issues of equivalent standards and mutual recognition. Because for those who don't follow this closely, the Brexit deal focused on goods, 80 to 90% of Britain's economy is services, and so you're left in this sort of uncomfortable position. And three, a UK that draws upon considerable assets uh, to develop networks of international partnerships, contributing, leveraging, improving. And this is where I think the LSE Commission focuses on the foundations for economic diplomacy, which should be a key part of this network. But second, and equally important, the US needs a strategy for post-Brexit Britain. <clears throat> I've seen a lot more stories about events in Myanmar than I have about US-Britain relations. 
And this is going to be a tricky challenge uh, because we're, we're used to past patterns, but here I, I think we need something different. We need a supportive embrace that also uh, allows the UK the flexibility to develop uh, roles within regional and, and global systems. So it would not help the UK if it just is seen as kind of a strategic appendage of the United States. You need something a little bit more complex in its, its relationship. And oddly, uh, maybe I'm missing something, but I see no discussion of this strategy uh, in the US. Now, maybe this is not so odd because Trump's style was to break things, not to build things. Um, but, you know, it's interesting as you see the reporting on, on uh, the Biden administration, I don't see any bold print item on the US-UK strategy. And I think this is a mistake from both a longer term geopolitical perspective where the United States will need special partnerships with the rimlands of Eurasia in geopolitical talk. Uh, and particularly that would mean the UK and Japan being vital allies, but also the basic facts. I mean, the UK is the major democracy, fifth largest economy, leading edge innovators. We've seen with vaccines and COVID, the universities such as LSE and others. Uh, Britain expects to spend more on defense than any other European. It's a member of NATO, uh, and uh, it's a nuclear power, it's intelligence partnership, UN Security Council, permanent member, uh, world leader in rule of law and justice issues, which will be important. And then the world-class institutions that actually have always allowed Britain to sort of punch above its weight, whether it's the Bank of England or the UK Treasury, or frankly, the development area. And so the third and final point is that I think the U.S. needs a strategy to fit post-Brexit Britain. And here, Gideon, I'm going to be tough on, on many of the columnists that I see. There seems to be this endless moaning among the, the good and the great about, you know, Never. reveling in Britain's decline. Well, you know, let's, let's look ahead. This is the reality. How are we going to face this? And uh, some of the points that Karen uh, mentioned, Biden has a democracy agenda. But I think actually there was a piece in the FT today or maybe a leader that sort of says, how does this actually work? You know, which countries do you include? So I would let London take the lead on the G7 with India, Australia, South Korea. But this is the critical point. You can't just have a meeting. To make this work, you're going to need some results, whether it's deliverables in, in areas like uh, uh, sort of COVID and pandemic or the overall recovery strategy. Then we've got the Glasgow COP meeting. And... Uh, what, what I, I know there's a lot of interest, but I haven't yet heard a diplomatic strategy that will also bring in the developing countries and including China. So China's made some very bold statements about what it's going to accomplish by 2060. But sort of I would be working quietly behind the scenes to see, you know, when will be peak emissions? What do you deal with all the investment in coal plants? Um, a closer alignment on defense and intelligence. In here, the recognition is in, in the new defense needs, you can't do everything. And so my sense would be a greater interoperability, uh, but always re re retaining the sovereignty that Britain needs to make its own decisions. This would probably focus on issues more like cyber and AI and sort of maritime capacity, uh, special operations, maybe space operations, as opposed to big platforms. And this will make be some very serious decisions. And then the biggest and most missing piece, and this comes out a little bit of the Carnegie report too, in a way, you need a trade and economic component. And frankly, I think uh, we already have signs of this, but we'll see more of it. I think the Biden administration has put trade on the back burner. It has a lot of uh, issues that it needs to deal with domestically. These can be difficult for its domestic political coalition. Um, I would approach this by connecting a North American agenda with the UK. It gives you more weight. It actually helps the North American uh, integration. Um, and as Ambassador Pierce mentioned, there are great opportunities here in the digital space, technology and uh, innovation, and frankly, to help bring along democratic constituencies, you could have labor provisions, which was key to the rewrite of NAFTA. You could have uh, positions that look, look at, at some of the carbon set of issues. Um, I believe you could get bipartisan support for this, which you would need to extend the negotiating authority, what's called uh, TPA here. And so as the Biden administration looks for areas where it might be bipartisan as it pushes stimulus package that may not be. Well, this, this could be one. Um, a, a key point I want to stress here, though, sometimes the discussion of U.S.-U.K. trade or North American-U.K. trade is seen as uh, an antithesis to the EU. I think that would be a mistake. Uh, this shouldn't be seen as, as zero sum. 
However, it needs to give the UK some sense of optionality and leverages and leverage in the service sector because those are covered by Brexit. And the current dynamic that you can see happening here is that the EU almost for defensive reasons emphasizes its more precautionary, even over-regulatory uh, sort of nature, which by the way, we're also seeing in its COVID policies, that will lead to great frustrations in the UK. And that's not good for either the UK or the EU. So if you look at an example like financial services, there's a lot of work done with the BIS and other sort of financial stability boards that can multilateralize this in terms of what would be the uh, sort of equivalent issues. So uh, I think there's a great opportunity here. There's a necessity with the US UK and I don't see much work on it. So I hope that this report will also, and this meeting will help prod that. Thanks, Bob. That was fascinating. Um, I'll come back to both Linda and Ros in a second, but I'd like to give the ambassador a chance to respond to some of those very concrete proposals. I'm sure what Bob Zellick said would be music to your, your, your ears, but um, he also particularly highlighted, you know, the opportunities for working together with America with COP26 coming up, the G7 and so on. So looking at those things and more generally, how are you going to try and take forward US-UK cooperation over the next year? Uh, I thought it was a, a, a great presentation from, from Bob and I'm going to tear up uh, the embassy's business plan. We all have business plans in the civil service uh, and I'm going to use Bob's article uh, in the FT as, as, as our uh, template. Um, I think our task is to weave all the different strands that Bob was talking about into some sort of coherent philosophy, strategy, call it what you will, uh, about how US and UK uh, drive certain concepts, uh, freedom, uh, competition, transparency, open societies uh, together. I think on the individual areas, climate, we're working closely uh, with the Biden administration and, and John Kerry uh, to raise the level of ambition in Glasgow in November uh, and actually make a, a reduction in, in global warming. Uh, and we don't neglect uh, China in this this con in this concept. Uh, China is is very important to certain global issues uh, like health uh, and like climate. Uh, I'd add more on health uh, to the list that that Bob came out with because uh, I think global health. Um, has been an area that's been underplayed for the last few years. Uh, and I think it's now uh, a very important aspect of all our international work, uh, economic and, and diplomacy. It's one area uh, where there's two, those two things are very much uh, woven together. Um, I think Bob is absolutely right to point to the agility uh, of a Britain outside uh, the EU. And I remember Chuck Hagel years ago saying that Europe and America were far too obsessed with the relationship between themselves uh, and the internal competition, the internal uh, transatlantic competition, rather than worrying about all the big things out there in the world, including China uh, and Russia. And I do think we need to get to a place where the transatlantic relationship is solid, it's three-pillared, it's US, EU, UK. Uh, we have a lot in common in that respect. And if we uh, use our various uh, comparative advantages, uh, we have a chance of moving the dial uh, on multilateral issues. And to uh, give you an example of, of that, uh, just after we'd left the EU at the UN, uh, it meant the UK could be far more uh, agile and independent minded uh, in discussions on human rights. So we were able to stake out uh, a very strong, robust position. Uh, which had the interesting effect of making the EU position look like the compromised position uh, compared to people who were right out over there in the other direction. And actually, collectively, uh, the West was stronger for being able to present the EU as the compromise rather than the pro-human rights uh, position. So there's an agility there. We see it in sanctions as well, uh, where we can really... Uh, try and get things back on track under the open society's agenda. Um, but I think Bob is right to challenge us on how we weave all that together uh, into a coherent whole and how we get the right sort of persuasive arguments uh, on levelling up and foreign policy so that we get more buy-in from our publics. 
Thanks, Karen. I mean, Roz, if I could come back on that point of buy-in from the public. I mean, it seems to me reading your report and just following the debate generally, that there's, there's a slight tension uh, between this desire to uh, not get ahead of the American public, but also a strong desire from the Biden team to show the world that America is back out there leading in a rather traditional fashion. And is there a danger that this concern about overstressing the, the middle class, whatever, will actually lead to a less active America, particularly on trade, where America just, you know, China's signing all these deals, RCEP, et cetera. America's not really gonna be signing trade deals, isn't it? And, and won't that be a bit of a problem for American leadership? Right. So, I mean, one thing we did find in the study, and you actually see it in public polling also, is there's actually generally support for trade. Um, it, it, this, it, trade is not, um, you know, a dirty word <laughs> among, among the, you know, American middle class. Uh, people understood generally that free trade created a lot of economic opportunities in the United States. If you, we went to Nebraska, for example, you know, big export, um, agricultural export state, very supportive of uh, trade um, and U.S. engagement with trade. So I think broadly speaking, we didn't hear, you know, don't do trade. What we heard was please make trade deals, right, that maybe deliver more tangible benefits that are a little easier for people to understand and that are paired better with domestic adjustment policies so that communities have the ability to, um, you know, get funds to kind of reinvent themselves, diversify some of their industrial bases, um, you know, make the adjustment um, more smoothly um, in the wake of trade. But I will say, I, I do think that's true. I, I do think that the point that Bob was making, and then I think you just made Gideon, is that the U.S. right now, the appetite is a little low for big, ambitious trade deals. Um, I think there's just a lot of things um, on the policy agenda, um, including economic recovery um, and COVID uh, relief and, and dealing with COVID at home. And I think that the administration has decided that that's going to have to be, they have to build back at home first. They have to really lead on those issues, um, get some public trust on those issues. And so on the diplomacy side, right, they're leading with the, you know, I think what is it? He said dip diplomacy is back at the center um, of U.S. foreign policy. So it'll be, you know, global engagement and trying to build the case that Americans are safer, the middle class is safer when the U.S. is engaged, has good relations, strong alliances, can leverage those relationships. So I do think you're seeing kind of like a broad kind of messaging around the need for the U.S. to engage, but no, like a lot of political capital is not going to go into major trade deals right away. And Linda, I mean, trade deals are something that we've probably been more headlines about in Britain in the last year or two, and you know, for the last generation. It became almost the emblem of what Britain was going to do uh, once it left the EU. You know, you've just done this whole report on economic diplomacy. Do you think that is the wrong way of thinking about economic diplomacy? Or are, in fact, trade deals really going to be absolutely at the centre of, of what we're trying to do? Um, I think, uh, Kitty, and a lot of the trade deals were to essentially uh, grandfather in existing trade deals we had via the EU. So I would say it was driven by necessity um, to uh, to maintain essentially continuity. Um, I think the, you know, thinking sort of stepping back, you know, the way that we looked at it was obviously, um, you know, in what way so the 21st century world, um, you know, different? What are the opportunities, the challenges? So for instance, Markets around services and digital trade are not as open um, because GATS, uh, which is the main multilateral kind of uh, you know um, agreement under the WTO that governs this, um, 1995 before the widespread uh, use of the internet. So there've obviously been other attempts, you know, WTO, um, you know, uh, you know, initiatives around domestic services regulation, the Osaka track and e-commerce, and all of this is all going on. Um, but what that means is you have a fragmented system. And for the UK, which is the world's second biggest exporter of services, the biggest exporter, I think, of financial services and one of the top ICT economies, um, the frictions is what trade agreements try to reduce because you don't have this multilateral uh, system in the same way that you have for goods where, you know, you can uh, sort of start with a better base where the UK 
is like the U.S., you know, one of the advanced economies that has a big services sector, this is sort of the reason why you need to open up markets. And that's what trade deals do. And they kind of give you market access because you can't just rely on, say, what the multilateral system, WTO system does. Um, but I think in this, in this um, commission, what we try to do is essentially say, think about the trade agreements um, and indeed the investment agreements <laughs> in a broader sense. You know, what are the multiple goals um, that such a relationship or partnership can begin to achieve on the non-economic front as well? So again, that taps into another challenge of the 21st century, which is there is a breakdown in consensus. There has been a backlash against globalization. Uh, you know, Roz is right. I think most people understand trade, but they want to see it bring more widespread benefits. So the buy-in needs to be worked on. And because of the, um, I'm going to describe it as great power competition. Others will use other terms. You know, the, the multilateral system really struggles um, because you've got, um, you know, you've got blocks and uh, and a bit of strategic competition going on. Um, so that framework suggests that, again, if you want to make headway in a bilateral, plurilateral sense, uh, marrying together um, economic and non-economic foreign policy aims writ large is very important. And being nimble in doing so, I think, is also really important. So in other words, different issues require different um, sets of countries almost because um, you're looking for shared interests. Shared interests around the environment are different than shared interests, um, say, you know, around another issue. So this ability to, I think, form, um, you, know, um, you know, partnerships with different groups of countries to try and fill some of the gaps um, where it's needed, either on global public goods, environment, health, global rules around technology, opening up services, digital trade, trying to get private sector expertise, which is so critical in formulating what standards should be in tech. All of that requires different coalitions at different times in order to try and essentially fill the gaps of, of the multilateral system. So I think this focus of the UK, as I say, was you know partly necessity, but I think this is also an opportunity to think about um, essentially taking all the strands of foreign policy and trade and investment policy and marrying it together and using that um, with the domestic, strong domestic links um, so that you are both addressing the backlash, but also furthering the UK's own domestic strategic growth aims. And I think, you know, I think Bob's, um, you know, I've enjoyed everyone's comments, you know, and I think Bob's article, you know, put that very clearly, you know, that has to, you know, that space um, the UK now has is a real opportunity to shape how it should set this kind of um, framework. Um, so I think that's probably um, why the uh, Commission's work has been so interesting, because, you know, it's not often that you have sort of, um, it necessitates a re-examination of, of the strategy that a country undertakes. And so I see trade and investment as part of it, but I would like to see that integrated into a much more holistic strategic approach towards how a country positions itself in this world with you know, many, many opportunities, but also significant challenges, which are very different than what we had in the previous century in many ways. I mean, Bob, uh, Linda kind of paints a portrait of Britain playing this sort of quietly constructive role around the world, filling in all the gaps um, and helping itself along the way. But, one danger that you alluded to in your opening remarks was that the UK and the EU get sucked into a kind of adversarial relationship. They're, they're trying to outdo each other, do each other down at, at certain respects. And certainly that does seem to me to be a real danger if you look at uh, the way things have been going in the last couple of months. Um, I, I assume that is not in America's interests, but is there anything America can do to, to try to help prevent that? Um, or, or would you just necessarily be a bystander? Um, Gideon, I'd like to address that, but if you don't mind, since I was pushing the United States and I wanna be an even-handed uh, mediator, I, yeah, I'd like please. to give uh, sort of a few thoughts to the British side and then we can, we can come to this. Um, so one piece of advice is don't split up. Uh, <laughs> this would signal breakdown uh, loss of control, 
uh, we'll have a session at Carnegie on US UK. We won't if it's Catalonia. Um, second, um, keep the economic fundamentals right. So this is the macro, the micro, the productivity. Linda's report focuses on this. And here, it's important that Britain recognize this is the foundation for your future role. And I'll be very direct with you. You know, I, I take part in events with uh, continental Europe, Asia. You, Britain doesn't come up that much because people don't know yet whether it's going to be sort of playing a role. It, it, you got to get the fundamentals right before you play in the game. Third, um, don't follow our mistakes about being protectionist. So openness is the key to this. Trade, investment, people, ideas. Frankly, the research is extremely strong about how foreign direct investment leads to knowledge transfer linkages and good paying jobs. Uh, when I grew up in Illinois, we used to consider that the middle class. Uh, fourth, encourage the science and technology investment. You got great opportunities here with universities and research, use them. Uh, keep the institutional pillars strong. Well, I talked about this. You know, these are the types of things watching from the World Bank I've seen across the different economies. You know, institutions like the Bank of England and the Treasury and frankly, your world-class civil service, these are extremely valuable. Other countries would die to have these set of things, so don't ruin them. Um, next, invest in the infrastructure for the future. Uh, IT, smart cities, uh, you know, the one that the LSE Commission always laughed when I mentioned is if you go to Asia, you notice how much they invest in nice airports. Their airports are always nice. They're always wonderful. They sort of make them as nice as possible. Any American tries to avoid Heathrow like the plague. You need a good airport if you want to be a sort of a major international power. Um, invest in human capital. Uh, this is at the heart of the report. Um, what's going to be interesting in this one is everybody knows you have to help people adjust to change. The, 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 there's, there's been a lot of research, including a group I take part in, the Aspen Economic Strategy Group, on place-based strategies. These are harder. They're much harder to do. Um, you probably need them, given the nature of Britain, but, they're, but it's going to require some careful thinking about sort of what's done. Um, then a point that Linda emphasized, which is the natural for the U.S. and Britain and Canada, Australia, Look at the networks beyond government. Don't look at this just as a government effort. You got to tap the private sector, uh, profit and nonprofit. And then here's a big issue. It's the sleeper issue that people will, will want to avoid talking about. But what's your risk philosophy? So, to, you know, to, to make this a slight parody, you know, EU has a precautionary risk policy. Let's regulate it before we innovate. OK, the U.S. doesn't have that approach. Now, there's arguments you could have in between. But if you're going to, and if you take a look at sort of Singapore, Singapore is not a non-regulated society, but they use sandboxes, they use trials, they use experiments. This is going to be a key decision. And we all know there's parts of British society that also likes to regulate and control things. So this is going to be a big policy decision. Um, next, problem solving, drawing on the institutions. Uh, this is a key to what Linda's talking about. Getting that, that match between sort of uh, national interests and public goals. Um, and then the last one, for goodness sakes, don't lose your standing as a country that takes uh, security seriously. Any of the Americans on this call will tell you there's bonus points for full service powers, okay? So Germany is very important. You know, we have to take account of it, but it isn't the same as Britain and France or even Australia. Um, and my suggestion would be building on this report align your security with your political economy goals. So that would be cyber systems, energy access, sea lanes, air lanes, space access. These are traditional sort of British notions uh, of security. But these will be difficult investment choices. It's easy to say this, but you have to decide where you're gonna uh, put your, your pounds on different things. Oh, and one last point on the, from the financial market side. From data that I've looked at, you know, Britain still has a slight advantage of the pound as kind of a residual reserve currency. You can see this in your current account sort of treatment. But this goes to the fact that all this debate about your financial sector and institutions and so on and so forth, pay attention to this. You've got an added benefit there that you don't want to sort of uh, let, let, let pass. So Gideon, coming back to your point, what I was trying to flag was, you, you know, as, as a daily reader of the Financial Times, you can see that, that there's this tension on, in the sort of equivalence debate. And you've had some actually some pieces on this. And you can almost see that the European Union is now in this defensive model where it treats Britain worse than it will treat other parties because 
it wants to protect itself. This is not good ultimately for the EU. That ultimately, this will make the EU service industries behind the curve. Now, if the US just went in directly and said, okay, Britain, why don't you become part of the US system? That would probably pose problems with British politics as well as the EU. But what if there was a way to say, look, we're trying to advance the state of the art in digital and some of these service spaces. And we can do some of this multilaterally. This fits the Biden approach. We can develop different standards where if we have sort of bodies that involve more than the US or, or, or Britain on these topics. And I think this is gonna be critical because I frankly think uh, it'll give Britain a little bit more leverage when it's negotiating these topics with the EU. It'll give it some options. And ultimately, it'll actually force the EU not to sort of uh, return to sort of its protectionist legal defensive model. So there's your question actually goes to something that's a longer term challenge. But again, going back to a point uh, that Roz and others made, unfortunately, this is where the US is behind the curve. If we don't engage Britain on a serious set of modern set of trade agreement, and right now the odds are we won't, um, we'll miss this opportunity and we'll miss a historic opportunity to help Britain become an allied partner for the next 30 years. Roz, I mean, that's uh, uh, a natural thing to pick up with you. You know these uh, th these guys who are, who are working in the uh, administration. You wrote this report with them. I, I take some encouragement from the fact that uh, both Bill Burns and Jake Sullivan are Oxford graduates, you know, so there must, must be a little piece of Britain somewhere in there. But uh, what do you think the likelihood is that they will take the special relationship seriously, uh, and particularly in that trade aspect, given all the the pressures. Do you think there's a scope for a UK-US trade deal? Is that the right thing to be thinking about? I don't know about, you know, these kind of, what do you call them, marquee, bilateral, you know, full spectrum trade deals. I, I think there's some hesitancy there. Uh, I think with the, you know, the TPP when it just kind of blew up in everybody's face after all of that work was really difficult. Um, and people are really concerned that those big deals that just kind of like, you know, lay out a huge number of issues are very hard for people to understand. They have a lot of implications for a lot of industries. I think that Bob's point is maybe more likely, which is people will pick up a couple issues here and there that they feel will deliver some clearer, more tangible um, benefits that they can link back to, you know, U.S. values, to U.S principles um, of, you know, innovation, maybe play to some of our strengths in services um, like Britain's um, services industry. So I, I do wonder if we're going to see more of a focus on issue specific work um, where they can really tell a story about what they're really going to achieve on environment, on health, on services, on FDI. Um, because those things, I think, are easier to talk about. They they solve a problem that the middle class maybe perceives versus the big headline, you know, UK, US signed this humongous deal and it, you know, there's a zillion things in there and it's 3000 pages long. And, and that gets a little bit more complicated, I think. So if, if I had to guess, I would guess they're going to be a bit more sympathetic to this. Let's solve problems that people care about. Let's work with allies. Let's cement some of those ties. Um, but of course, I think on Bob's point that, you know, there's huge numbers of areas where the U.S. and the U.K. are very closely aligned. I mean, I was in Intel for, you know, three years. You know, it's a very close relationship. There's very close working ties in NATO. Uh, so on the on the security side, I think there's some really strong potential. Um, you know, on econ and trade, I think there will be. I just don't think, you know, you're going to get some, as I said, full spectrum deal. I think it's going to be more. I don't know, a la carte as we sort of sort through what the, the major priorities are. Yep. Well, yeah, that then I, sets I, up uh, the I, last, just, sorry, uh, Bob, you want to say something? Yeah, just a quick point. I, I, I don't differ with Raz's analysis, but I want to push it um, because as her own uh, research shows, as does the Chicago Council on Global Affairs research, the American attitudes about trade are like 70, 80% supportive. Now these are sort of general attitudes. My experience as a trade representative who negotiated most of America's FDAs is when you come time to Congress, people are voting for the country as much as anything else. So it's not accidental that in an election year, I think we got 80 Senate votes for Australia. It is just inconceivable to me that if an administration pushed, you couldn't get a serious support for US UK. And I've tested this with Republican members of the Senate Finance Committee. It's unnatural 
Now, I don't disagree with what Raz is saying. What I'm saying is this is a whole question of political leadership, as it always has been in, in, in US and trade. And I think the challenge sort of partly coming out of, I hope sort of even this event and the LSE report is to prod people to think about this in a somewhat different fashion. And as I mentioned, if you look at the USMCA vote, the NAFTA sort of vote, the sort of redone vote, the reason you got democratic votes is you put in labor provisions. Are we really so concerned about labor standards in Britain or could we get union support? You know, could you put in something on carbon? So my argument here is, this is how, to be honest, new policy gets made, is you push people to sort of say, well, maybe there's public support in Congress, maybe you can get public opinion, maybe you can add in some new issues. So that's what Carnegie should do. Okay, well, we've got about uh, four minutes left, so I think I'll give Ambassador Pierce the, the closing word and a chance really to comment on, on that really interesting issue. Where do you stand? Do you think we're gonna get this big overarching deal or is it more practical to go the route that Rod suggests, pick a couple of issues, maybe you could name them and, and focus in on them. Um, I agree that the world is changing and big trade deals are not what they were. And they're much more likely to become big economic deals covering, as, as others were saying, uh, a much bigger waterfront of digital labor uh, and environment. But I do agree with Bob. Uh, it is possible uh, to get the FTA with the US. We'd like to, to get it. Uh, I don't want to preempt the Biden administration. Catherine Tai uh, hasn't been confirmed yet. This is obviously a conversation uh, to have with her when she is. Uh, but we wouldn't see a reason not to try and we wouldn't, uh, and we'd be ready uh, to talk about these environment, labor, digital uh, aspects. I do think there's something important though, which, which goes back to what Ros was saying about UK and US trailblazing in, in some of these areas. Uh, we're on the threshold of some very important uh, transformations. And just as UK and US led the way in some of the nuclear uh, developments back in the 50s, I do think we stand on the threshold of being able to do the same uh, for technology. And it goes back to some of what Bob's uh, prescriptions uh, for the UK were around investment, around infrastructure, around science and, and innovation. Uh, and I worry that we might not organize ourselves uh, to take advantage of these opportunities with, with the US. Uh, but people are thinking about it. The Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, would absolutely agree with the focus on problem solving. Uh, that's very much uh, how he sees the UK uh, in the context of, of um, you know, making the world uh, safer, open societies. And um, he really would want to put the emphasis on what we do uh, on technology. But if I can just come back to Bob's article, um, the bit at the end where he quotes the we think in English, uh, I think that does say something very important about the difference uh, between Europe and the precautionary principle and the UK, US slightly more freedom, permissive, it's allowed unless it's banned. Uh, you can apply that to the economy, you can apply that to technology in particular. And I think our next task uh, is not so much to redefine the special relationship, but to move the special relationship and, and the way it works into these very new areas uh, of digital uh, and technology, which hopefully uh, will have a benefit for the world more generally in terms of upholding the open society agenda. Okay, well, thank you very much. Our hour is just about up. Uh, it's been a great discussion, fascinating discussion. So it's been great to be able to link up across the Atlantic to have it. And thank you to both uh, report writers, uh, to Linda Yu, to Ros Engel, for giving us a basis to discuss, to Bob Zellick, of course, and to Ambassador Pierce. Thank you all and uh, goodbye for now. Thanks very much, Gideon. Thank you, everybody. I thought Bye -bye. that was terrific. Thank you.